This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Kara Frederick, and I've been excited to talk to her for quite some time. I read an article she wrote for heritage.org titled Combating Big Tech's Totalitarianism, a Roadmap. Uh, February 7th, go check out that article uh, on heritage.org. But Kara is a fascinating person, grew up in a Marine family, has a master's from King's College London in war studies, went to the Defense Intelligence Agency, was attached to the NSA, was attached to JSOC, did three deployments to Afghanistan before going to Facebook, where she was recruited to start and lead Facebook's global security counterterrorism analysis program. Interesting. We talk about her experience at Facebook on this podcast. She then went to the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security before moving to where she is now. And she is the director of the Tech Public Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation. And I really wanted to talk to her about the relationship between big tech and big government. So now... Without further ado, Kara Frederick. Well, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And I got to tell you, I've been so excited to talk to you. Like, I mean, as a parent and a citizen, thinking about big tech, their influences over not just our behaviors, but our thoughts and where that is going with emerging technologies. I mean, it fits right at what you're studying and what your focus is right now falls right in line with the things that I think about daily. And then also that I weave into the, uh, the novels. Um, I noticed. I know. Uh, the last one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The last one, that was pretty little, a little artificial intelligence, quantum computing. And I knew nothing about that stuff other than they existed. I didn't really know much about them. And then going, doing the deep dive into that. And then two things that I didn't even put in that book that I wanted to explore that I think I will in the future is you add passive targeting and hypersonic weapons to AI and yep. quantum computing kind of yep. as a, as a whole and what, uh, what China's doing in that realm. Like I wanted to go down and talk about some of that, but it didn't fit with the, with the novel and the, the storyline. So that'll make its way into a future novel though. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, that's, that is the future. That's the next frontier. So if yeah. you could write about it, that would be great. Get it to our audience because I mean, it's funny and I'm, I'm sure you want to start here, but there's so many people. Oh, we're the, started. We're started. Oh, we're on. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> um, there's so many people, especially of the conservative ilk who, you know, we tend to pay attention to some aspects of it, like the, the moral issues, which I think is massive and huge, but mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have the bodies that understand uh, how dangerous this is going to be. And it mm -hmm. is a national security issue. And you have to, as you said, sort of weave in sort of the moral implications of, say, what China's doing with TikTok and learn how to talk about it in those terms, because they are going to be hard cyber threats in the end. And people are just very uncomfortable with that. And yeah. it's, uh, it's something we have to be able to articulate. Yeah. And it, there's so many distractions also that keep us from focusing on things that, and really doing that, uh, that deep dive and putting that requisite time, energy, and effort into the study of these issues, because we're being distracted all these times and distracted by things that are purposely meant to divide, which who does that benefit? Well, tech companies and government entities, because they, they thrive off that division and they exist oh, yeah. off that division, one uh, monetarily, and then the other a galvanizing basis so they can stay in these elected positions. So I talk about it as a, I think about it as an L ambush. So we're, we're set up, they're set up like this. You have big tech over here. You have big government right here. And here we go walking into the middle of this thing because we kind of have to, if you're building a business today, uh, you can't just build it on a 1980, 1985, 1990 model. You have to use these tools that are available that people are on and all the social channels and what we're doing right now. And, and all these platforms that are controlled by this side of the ambush over here. Yeah. So it's crazy. But before we deep dive too much into this stuff, like I want to, I rarely do I read some, someone's background, but yours is so impressive that I want to just go through and, uh, and read a couple of things here and then ask you how your path about your path to the heritage foundation, because it's fascinating. And you've been studying things that, uh, that, that I've been fascinated with for, for my entire, entire life and the things you studied for your bachelor's and your master's. Um, but, uh, but right now you are the director of tech public policy, the center at the heritage foundation. Like, yep. 
That's amazing. And But before that, you were a fellow at the Technology and National Security Center program at the Center for a New American Security. Awesome. And before that, you spent a little time at Facebook. You went behind the lines. Yes, and uh, you were a part of their, I think they recruited you for their global security counterterrorism analysis program because of where you were before that. Uh, and you were at Naval Special Warfare Development Group and you were a senior intelligence analyst. Uh, you focused on counterterrorism at the DOD and you deployed to Afghanistan at least three times, I believe. Yeah. Um, I mean, and then you were a liaison to the NSA. I mean, incredible. But before that, and then you had a, let's see, a, ba a bachelor's from University of Virginia, a master's from King College in war studies, but you grew up in a Marine Corps family. I did. I did. Yep. My dad was a pilot. So okay. I wanted to be my dad. I wanted to nice. be a pilot. I wanted to go to the Naval Academy. Uh, I was blind as a bat. So I sort of realized at that point that was not uh, going to be a reality for me, okay. but ended up, I played soccer in college. So I was sort of loath to give that up, went to England, played for a little bit. And my father being the pragmatic individual that he was, was like, Carrie, you got to get a real job. <laughs> you know, you're 24 years old. You're playing soccer in a foreign country. Yes, you're getting your grad degree, but come on, let's get a real job. So I signed up for Marine Corps OCS uh, and uh, <laughs> ended up hurting my uh, my knee in soccer when I was playing over there. And my dad was like, Kara, I'm going to give you a dose of reality here. You can't go to OCS with a bum leg. You can't. I know you think you can do it, but uh, but so it was in a stroke of luck. I ended up getting recruited by a, the redheaded stepchild of the intelligence community called the Defense Intelligence Agency, oh, yes. um, which was, I mean, it was great for me because at the time, Afghanistan was going, uh, Iraq was going. And when it comes to thrusting a young person and in, in the middle of everything uh, into the maw, really, of those wars and giving them a, a high degree of responsibility, DIA was pretty much the only place that was doing it. You know, if you went to uh, the agency CIA, they would make you sit at headquarters for two years before they kick you out there. But I ended up getting in in January and I was on a plane to Afghanistan by August. Nice. What was the training like for that? So you, you put in your package, you apply and then you get accepted. And then what's that pipeline like between that January and, and August? Yeah. So they send you to all sorts of schools. You know, I'd never handled a weapon before, but they give you your SIG. Uh, they give you your Beretta. I prefer the SIG. Um, they give nice. you your M4. <laughs> and then you basically just, uh, they, they teach you how to shoot, you know, a bunch of old Marines at the range um, over and over again, teaching little girls like me. I'm about a hundred pounds soaking wet, uh, how to, how to handle a weapon uh, if needed. Uh, never needed, but <laughs> it was funny when I was deployed with some of the, the army guys, the equivalent of a uh, Naval Special Warfare Development Group, but for the army, uh, they basically were like, if you have to use your weapon, we're all screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so I sort of, I took that to heart. That's right. Never had to, which was great. Um, but they, they put you through driving courses. You learn SDRs, uh, which mm -hmm. feature in some of your work. They, they do. <laughs> um, yes, so, yes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, so all that stuff, it's sort of like a, I would say like um, CIA light training. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, I mean, we just, it, this was 2010, the early days. So we needed bodies, you know, Eastern Afghanistan. They had um, Al Qaeda guys over on the border there. And I was an Al Qaeda targeter, um, target developer at DIA, uh, changed in my next jobs. But yeah, they basically wanted us out there using um, the the skills that we acquired for for targeting, developing pattern of life. Uh, we were all source analysts, so we did all the, the SIGINT intelligence analysis. We did the human intelligence analysis. We put it all together, uh, and uh, yeah, we found um, uh, certain targets and basically pointed the assault force in the right direction. Right, right. Yeah, I have a little bit of experience with uh, with that side of it. Um, but before I did, before I went to Buds, they made you take a you had to have a, a rating back then to go to Buds, and so I was an IS. So I went to uh, Nimitzi, so Naval Marine Corps Intelligence Training Center, yep. and did that for I forget sixteen weeks or something. Anyway, and then went to Buds, and but that was late nineties. So I. Um, I think I could have tested out of it just because of all the Tom Clancy novels that I'd read. And then the Tom Clancy nonfiction that he wrote, like submarine and uh, aircraft carrier and fighter wing and all those things. But it was so focused on cold war still. And like looking at a silhouette of something on a piece of paper and then having to, you know, 
identify it or whatever. Like that was uh, wow. a lot of bit of what it was in the late nineties. It hadn't evolved yet very much. Um, of course I think it did after September 11th, but then I went to buds and never really worked in the rate other than putting target packages together and, and being part of that intelligence cycle and, and all that. But, um, but that's amazing. So I worked with the defense intelligence agency in, and you, it's funny you say that t- uh, 2010 of the early days, cause, uh, 2004, I think in Missoula, uh, they had a house up there yep. on one of the bases and I was working with them up there as a liaison, um, uh, doing similar things. Uh, but really learning, you know, learning because we're still developing, still trying to figure out, okay, human intelligence network, another one over here, they don't disassociate it and then corroborate some of that with some technical intelligence and put these packages together to make sure you're going after the right person for the right reasons and not making the situation worse, um, you know, by going and settling some centuries old score instead of actually taking somebody off the, uh, off the, uh, off the battlefield that needs to be taken off. So Anyway, it was an interesting, interesting time. Um, but it's interesting you say that 2010 are the early days, but they were the early <laughs> days for you. Cause I think on 9-11, are you in, are you in high school then? On I'm in 9/11? high school. I'm in high school at the time. And I just remember thinking, you know, nothing would be the same. My, my dad being the Marine, you know, we were, he was stationed at Quantico and we were in Northern Virginia. And I remember some of my classmates getting pulled out of class, uh, we, the teacher, you know, wheeled in that big TV and we just watched all morning and then we got dismissed early. But I, I really, I just remember they were playing the next day, Whitney Houston's uh, version of the Star Spangled Banner. And I was looking out the window of a car of our car as my mom was driving and children were still playing on the lawns and whatnot. And, you know, I was single tier kind of moment, but I was like, nothing will ever be the same. Nothing will yeah. be the same from here on out. So it was, uh, it mattered then. And yeah, it changed the, the course of my life. I mean, who yeah. knew that I was going to, you know, go into the intelligence community and start targeting uh, the guys affiliated with the guys who did it. So. Yeah. No, it's amazing how this path takes shape. And then uh, what you studied in college and then at King's College. And I've looked at that King's College program so many times. Uh, and then the, the one also with uh, in Scotland, which I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but uh, I've looked at those programs so many times. And King's College has so many different um, war studies programs that focus on certain aspects of warfare. It's, it's fascinating just to look at the, the website. I haven't looked at it in a few years, but um, yeah, I never, never did it, but uh, I've looked at it many times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was one of the only places and I was, you know, of course, always been a civilian in my entire career, but it was the one place when I tell people who were thinking about getting a degree there where a civilian could learn about tank movements in the battle space. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really, really took the granularity on, you know, the conduct of contemporary warfare very, very seriously. So they had the, you know, the usual sort of West Pointers getting their grad degree mm-hmm. and active duty kids and, you know, post, um, you mm-hmm. know, veterans there as well, but they had real you know, civilian uh, meat for us to chew yeah. on. You know, one of my professors was in the IDF uh, and, you know, Israeli Defense Forces. Mm-hmm. And he talked about sitting on the tanks and watching uh, the Air Force go and obliterate Egypt. Wow. <laughs> and then uh, Lori Friedman, you know, Michael Howard's books where we read them widely. Um, it was it was just oh, it was fantastic. I'd re- highly recommend it to anyone. The English system's a little different. They, uh, mm. it's sink or swim there. They don't hold your hand at all, but I like that. I think if you're a self-starter anyway, I, you're going to thrive. Yeah. So it's old school, old school oh, education yeah. back there. I like oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Um, and so you go from there and you go to the defense intelligence agency, you're assigned to, uh, I guess elements of JSOC is the best way to put it. And you get to really work at the the tip of the special operations spear when you're talking about intelligence. Um, and you go down range with them and then at some point here, you head over to Facebook and they think they recruit you because of that background, because of that, that terrorism thing that they're, that they want to want to do. Um, and, uh, going out there to California, Menlo park, what was it, what was it like? What were your takeaways from, uh, from your, was it a year, year and a half at, uh, at Facebook? Yep. It, it was culture shock. And I'm originally from California when, you know, my dad was a Pendleton Marine. We were at Irvine and El Toro and all those places when they were still um, up and running. So, you know, I figured, oh, the Bay Area, it's a natural extension of where I grew up. Totally different, totally different. And, you know, because I I tell the story a lot, but I, I worked at Fort Meade at NSA. Um, I was an embed there twice and Mm. uh, we were doing some 
really cutting edge stuff. It was for then. I mean, now it's it's way it's old. It's completely Crazy. outdated. My knowledge is stale. Um, but but they they wanted me because we've done that social network analysis. We um, I'm sure you know Jack from your time and the teams. Uh, we were working with cell phones and and using that kind of uh, mm. those methods. Uh, but then we started getting into to computers and you know what we could do there. Uh, when I at the tail end of my time at NSA, so Facebook was super interested in social network analysis and sort of bringing that uh, knowledge and really, you know, what you, the training from the bureaucracy that had these systems and muscle memories already intact and bringing it over to Facebook where we were building an airplane in mid-flight when it came to these ISIS guys, when it came to all of the networks um, on on their platforms. So I, the story I tell is when I, I walked in there and, you know, I thought I was really cool showing my NSA bona fides and I'd, I'd talk about it. And this was, you know, post Snowden. And there was one person where he just looked at me and refused to shake my hand. Oh, you're the NSA girl. Oh, <laughs> and, wow. uh, and it was very much, you know, there was a sort of a, a tension there where they weren't exactly bleeding red, white, and blue. Um, they don't, they don't yeah. now either, but not a shocker. I don't think anyone listening or watching this is, uh, is shocked by that. Um, <laughs> it was, was it immediately apparent? I mean, obviously from that interaction, but as a whole that they, uh, that the culture of that place wasn't really, Hey, we're an American company, but like, Hey, we're a, we're a global entity. We're a global powerhouse. We're a global company. And, uh, they're not putting the, the let's, I guess the best way to put it is they're not putting, uh, the, the, uh, best, um, uh, it's, they're not focused on putting America first when they're making their decisions. So they're looking at policies or they're looking at culture or they're looking at their stra- strategic plan yeah, for the years, decades ahead. Um, I don't think that they'd be putting America first. Was that your takeaway or one of them? Oh, it, it was gobsmacking. I mean, yeah. it was, that was the pervasive mentality. And mm. the the way I used to talk about it is, you know, there was sort of a uh, a lack of, of geopolitical cognition that centered in on America, right? Like mm. America's position in the world was not something that they lost any sleep over or even thought about. And uh, another story that I tell about my time at Facebook is when I kept saying, you know, we're an American company and blah, blah, blah. And then finally, uh, someone sat me down and they were basically like, Kara, you have to stop saying that. We are a global company. We are not an American company. Stop saying that. And I was just like, you know, completely naive, completely floored. But I, whenever I go to the Hill, I try to tell people like that is the ethos. And, you know, they'll say different things. You know, they're all apple pie when they have to be, when some of these antitrust bills are up for, mm. are up for a vote and being bandied about. But, but for the most part, I mean... Facebook has approximately 90% of their user base outside of the U.S. and Canada. Uh, oh. Growth is paramount to them. And that growth, right. not necessarily taking part in, in the United States. And they know it. Yeah. Ah. I mean, it's crazy. It's such a, an elitist mentality in, in the worst sense of the, of the word. Um, do you think they see themselves as, uh, you know, as above American ideals? And, and it's just, it's so tough because, Obviously, this country has given them the freedom to create these companies. I believe it's incorporated in Delaware. Like, <laughs> like I don't know what percentage of American companies are incorporated in Delaware, but quite a few. Um, but we, you know, people have sacrificed so much from the inception of this country up until today to give them the freedom to create these companies that now they kind of put America at the bottom of their priority list and uh, focused well, on profits and maybe now more even more than on profits on, uh, on influencing behaviors and thoughts. Yep. Yep. And and that to me, it was, it was so obvious, the pervasive lack of gratitude for the system that allowed them to flourish and thrive. I mean, that is why they're successful, right? In fact, these companies are, are artifacts of even, you know, federal regulations like Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, with, which grants them immunity from civil liability for things on their platform, content on their yeah. platform. So they just don't really you know, you think of uh, the the person next to you as a sort of a great engineer, you know, not a, a great citizen. And they could be yeah. from anywhere, like like China. They could be an IP uh, theft threat, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the, that did not cross their imaginations whatsoever. They were the locus of power in the universe. You know, who cares about people in D.C. and their sensible black shoes? This is where all the magic was happening. This is what mattered most to anything. And, you know, we'll ship it. And, uh, you know, I have friends who basically say, you know, ask for forgiveness later. Mm. <laughs> so they'll do whatever they want for the products and maybe governance comes on the back end. And they knew they had the advantage in that regard. So they were the ones who had all the power. 
gosh, do you think it's a, a, a power, the allure of absolute power that, uh, that entices those maybe senior level executives and that, that, that goes all the way down to, to the lowest levels. And plus we have culture in general now from Hollywood to even sports, obviously academia that, uh, kind of molds people to, uh, to fit into a culture like that and look down on America and all the freedoms that, uh, that allowed them to be living the life that they're living in Menlo park. You know, I, at the senior leadership level, I truly believe that a lot of these men who were, you know, some women, but mostly men at the time were, were very libertarian minded, right? Mm. They, they were the builders. They were the ones who were solving problems Uh, to get at the heart of how a a programmer or an engineer thinks they're ultimately problem solvers. Um, You you just look at Mark Zuckerberg, right? It took so many lessons for him to be able to get out in front of people and actually speak and sound relatively human uh, because he thinks (laughs) work in in progress, work in progress. I think. (laughs) Yep. Yep. He's it's always, what's the technical fix, right? Mm. What, People can, not people, but the world and the the issues that they present are just problems to be solved. Mm. Um, there's sort of a techno solutionism there um, that that I think was the original allure. And you even have people who like Peter Thiel, right, who, who support Trump, who support um, some of the more conservative power players here. I, I don't necessarily think that they're like, yes, ultimate cosmic power kind of stuff. They're more like, how do we change and move the world? Now, the, the middle managers, uh, the bureaucracies that have really grown up in these companies, I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're become intoxicated with uh, control, uh, their ability to sort of dictate how uh, humans, you know, peons like us can use the platforms that exist and what we can say. And that's really trickled down. But I think, I think in the beginning, uh, their intentions were good, but yeah. we know what hell's paved with, right? Yeah, good intentions. Um, oh man, it's so, so crazy. And, uh, wow. So you think it became this, this, this monster or not just Facebook and, you know, by default now Instagram and, you know, all the, the, the parent company, I guess, and everything that's involved there, but, uh, but Twitter. And I think somebody at Twitter, was it the CEO, new CEO, did he say something about, you know, Hey, the, the first amendment is not really on our list of priorities or something along those lines. Um, and it seems like all those big tech companies, I think it just grew into a, and Twitter of all of them, I seem seems like to be the one from, you know, looking from the outside in, uh, the one that seems to be the most libertarian of all at the beginning anyway. And then now yeah. it's just grown into these monsters. And it seems like from the outside looking in, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey, it looked like it just became this crazy thing. And then he goes off on, doesn't he go off on crazy trips and just disappears for a long time and then comes back. And, you know, it seems like they just become these unmanageable monsters um, that maybe did start off with good intentions. And when, I want to ask you uh, later about this, uh, your latest article uh, from June 1st about social media and kids, but you know, all these people that created these things, I mean, they have to know this data and see that they're hurting kids and yeah, they can keep the iPads and iPhones out of their kids' hands for a certain number of years, but maybe not forever. And I don't know, that's a tough thing to, to live with, to know that maybe you started out with these good intentions, but look what it's morphed into. And now exactly. what do you do? That it's grown into this huge monster. Yep. And, and that's, you know, Jack Dorsey from his own mouth, right? Like we are the, the free speech wing of the free speech party. That was supposed to be what Twitter is. And it's metastasized into this, you know, yes, it's a bastion of influence where all the important people uh, are, you know, providing discourse and engaging in, you know, not even a genuine marketplace of idea, but a, um, a, a restricted one rather. And it's completely, it's completely different from their vision. And, in terms of how they they feel their or the recognition of these products potentially hurting uh, kids and and humanity in general, you know, I I still think that there's a a degree of sort of Stockholm syndrome um, mm-hmm. that a lot of these people experience when you're in the thick of it, when you're uh, in the belly of the beast, so to speak. You do think that you know you are doing things that matter enormously to moving society forward to mm-hmm. progress and. I've, I think the best illustration of this is Instagram deciding to create a platform for children under 13. Um, and they paused it because of public outcry and the Facebook 
whistleblower releasing all those documents and the research that show, yeah, this is actually materially harmful to children. Um, but they said, we still believe that it's the right thing to do. And mark my words, they're going to move forward with it. Um, yeah. YouTube already has platforms and, and they think we are in the best position to control what these children see in the environment for these children. You rubes in the flyover states who think that this is a net negative for your children, you're wrong because we'll make it better for your children. Mm -hmm. And that's the pervasive ethos. Ah, it's so scary as a parent and a citizen. It's uh, it's frightening. I think about it quite often. Um, but what made so after that, that incredible background, uh, your time at Facebook, and I don't even think I need to ask you why you left. I think it's fairly obvious. Um, uh, but uh, what made you want to focus on big tech censorship and emerging technology policy at uh, the Heritage Foundation? Yes. Yeah, so I started out sort of in the, in the policy field, looking at artificial intelligence and global security. Um, but I have to say COVID. COVID was a massive motivator because it let me sort of, you know, cut out all the dross in my life and, and really focus on my craft. And what I found to me was something that crossed the Rubicon. It was when the Hunter Biden laptop story was stifled in the election cycle of 2020 in the fall uh, by Twitter, by Facebook. I My mouth was hanging open when I was really just, you know, all you had to do in COVID was just read and read and read, right? So I was looking at this in real time and I was, I just thought, what is going on? Like, this is beyond the pale. And then the parlor situation early in the next year in January happened where, uh, you know, Google, Apple, okay, I understand uh, what they did. It was wrong and uh, it didn't really make sense. But when Amazon Web Services mm -hmm. yanked their services from their cloud hosting services from parlor, that to me was like, okay, the whole build your own mantra, like that's a bankrupt trope. Yeah. <laughs> These guys, they want not just information manipulation and control, but they want to be able to control access to information. Mm -hmm. You know, when you rip a, a platform and it completely goes dark um, off of the internet uh, because of, you know, a, uh, frankly, a, a made up excuse, that to me was like, okay, I gotta get, I gotta get, it, get on the right side here. And I gotta make sure that, you know, we're talking as somebody who's been there and seen how these platforms work. Um, I've, I've gotta be in the fight. I just have to. So that was, that was the whole idea. Well, I'm glad you made that decision because I mean, this is uh, the next decade, I think is going to be uh, uh, pivotal uh, as far as what we've well, for the last 200 some years, uh, thought about as freedom and, and, uh, and freedom of speech and being able to think on our own and walk into that voting booth and vote for, you know, the, the person that we want to rather than who we've been manipulated to, uh, to vote for. Um, exactly. but, uh, this, uh, this is an awesome, so I, this right here, you, uh, you wrote an article February 7th, combating big tech's totalitarianism, a roadmap right here. And, uh, for people that are watching this, don't be afraid with how, how thick that is, uh, because read it. And then these first few pages summarize everything. And then if you want to deep dive, all the data is in here, uh, to include something, uh, what, is, what, was, what happened to Breitbart's, uh, 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 web act, whatever it went down by like 99% yeah. during the last election cycle. Yep. Yep. Mm, interesting. And this is not even touching on where the Google spam filters we now know uh, take about two thirds of conservative candidates and put their emails in spam while retaining the large majority of Democrat politicians mm. in your Gmail. So, I mean, this is it's all and completely up and down the tech stack, what we call the tech stack. So not just digital platforms, you know, your Facebooks and your Twitters, not just AWS when it comes to uh, cloud hosting services, but email delivery services. Now we're looking at internet service providers. The censorship is completely pervasive and it pretty much only goes one way. It really, it really does. And you, and you pointed out in here, it's something that we, you know, we all know, but now we have this, you can point to specific uh, instances. And I mean, it's all spelled out in here. And I, and I love it because of that big tech, big government. I mean, I really think that, like I said, like we're walking into that, that ambush, we're in the middle of it. And, uh, and, but we have to, I mean, if you're building a business, like I said, you have to be in there and now, but that's just giving more data and more reliance on uh, both of those entities and can shut you off. Like you just said, with Amazon web services uh, in a second. Um, it's just, the cancel, you add cancel culture to that and everything else that, that goes into it. It's just a, what a, a crazy time. Um, but I love how you talk about how big tech, big government undermine is undermining our, our freedoms, uh, the freedoms of a functioning Republic, um, how they want to reshape society really without consent of the govern, uh, silence, dissenting views. Um, so what trends are you seeing in big tech, big government collusion for lack of a, of a better word? 
Yeah, I think this is huge. And we're, we're really sort of starting to see uh, the, the evidence now. Um, the Disinformation Governance Board. Um, I don't know if you've sort of seen the letter from Senator Hawley, who's basically a whistleblower came to him and showed him documentation that Twitter executives um, had been reached out to by the government, uh, that they were trying to operationalize this. Um, and we know from what Jen Psaki, the former White House press secretary, uh, said in front of the cameras numerous times, uh, she basically said, we're working with Facebook to flag problematic posts. That mm -hmm. means you have uh, people like the Surgeon General, people at the highest levels of the executive branch of our government working with tech companies to police the speech of Americans. Um, I, and they're admitting it. This, if they feel so brazen that they can say this out loud, you know, what are they doing behind closed doors? The Disinformation Governance Board whistleblower documents uh, pretty much show that, hey, we're, we're actually enacting this. It's happening at the state level as well with some conservative commentators. Uh, so we basically have an administration that's working with the most powerful tech companies in the world to censor the speech of Americans, working hand in glove. Uh, the digital surveillance aspect, too. Um, you might have seen the Heritage Foundation is actually suing the Biden administration for information on how DHS uses Babel Street. Um, and these are companies, private companies that you and I are per pretty familiar with. Uh, they're basically like social media aggregators who collect open source data, uh, OSINT, and, uh, and identify patterns and whatnot. So, um, yes, the government has had contracts with them for a while. But now that we've seen the entire national security apparatus turned inward on Americans, weaponized against everyday American citizens, mm -hmm. I think we deserve some answers. So <laughs> my place of business is basically asking for them. And, um, you know, frankly, this administration has been no stranger to making end runs around the Constitution outsourcing uh, those, you know, surveillance capabilities to private companies, uh, the Fourth Amendment kind of comes into mm -hmm. play here. So, so I think that's really the next frontier. Yeah, I wish some of those people that we've elected into positions would actually read the Constitution and people that we did not elect, that bureaucracy that just seems to grow more powerful, have more influence with each, each passing day. But I mean, you're out there on the front lines of this thing. And uh, for people who have heard of uh, Section 230, uh, uh, passed in a pre-internet world, um, you know, people hear about it and as they're passing the TV, taking care of the kids and they're kind of like, what? Uh huh. So, uh, but the way I've heard you explain it before and I love how you explain it, but it comes from what the communications decency act of 1996, which also is a strange, is a, is a strange title. I mean, I don't know some of these ones that when they have titles like that, it makes me go, Hmm, interesting. So even the title of that one, I don't, I don't like, but from a pre-internet world, and it was supposed to take out content that was otherwise objectionable. I think was the, and then otherwise objectionable has turned into uh, anyone I don't agree with as big tech or maybe someone with a conservative view. Um, so that content that is otherwise objectionable seems to have been uh, interpreted to, uh, to mean what it didn't, but they didn't think it meant 1996, I guess. Uh, but um, uh, when someone else said what the 26 words that created the internet or something like that is part of that, I guess it was part of help. It was part of it was trying to help build the this new thing called the the internet back then, um, but uh, it's it's really turned into a censorship, allowing people to, these big tech companies to to censor. But can you describe that what, what really this section is and and uh, and how it's impacting us today? Yeah, so it's famously described as the twenty six words that created the internet, and the whole idea behind Section two thirty of the Communications Decency Act was that it gives these um, these platforms, essentially, these social media companies, these, you know, covered companies, so these internet uh, services burgeoning, you know, in the 1990s, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to have immunity from civil liability for content that's on their platform. So say, uh, in the comments section of, you know, one of these new companies, somebody's like, I'm going to kill everyone. It makes sure that people can't sue those companies for something some rando posts in the comment. Mm -hmm. And it also gives them cover for sort of good faith efforts uh, to purge some of this content from their platforms as well, because you don't want smut on the platforms, right? It would just be a horrible user experience if, the first thing that happens when you open up Twitter is uh, naked bodies and et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. I don't know. It could be good for some people, not for me, <laughs> not for my eyes or my uh, my future daughter's eyes or anything right. like that. <laughs> so, so it basically allowed 
these companies to to sort of thrive and and flourish uh, without the specter of litigation sort of haunting them and and frankly stifling them in the crib. And however, uh, you mentioned the otherwise objectionable bit. I mean, you give tech companies an inch and they have taken a mile. So they've used the otherwise objectionable quote to, to frankly just remove a lot of conservative content. And they're doing that now. So easy fix, strike that uh, from Section 230. Don't allow these platforms to have uh, immunity from civil liability if they censor based off of political viewpoints. And uh, clarify what is protected uh, under the First Amendment through Section 230 as well. Because we're trying to drive these platforms to at least a First Amendment standard as their guiding principle, um, as something that they they look to and they value, unlike what the Twitter CEO has said before, uh, so that that can color all of their content moderation and policy decisions going forward. So far, we're not seeing that happening, but there's a there's a lot of stuff, a lot of drafts going around on the Hill that hopefully we'll, we'll get some purchase sooner rather than later. Yeah. So when thinking about that, you know, we've, we've been hearing this Section 230 for a while now, uh, last few years anyway. And I guess uh, government moves very slowly. It's a gigantic bureaucracy, um, but they don't seem in a rush to, uh, to fix this. And they haul, you know, they, they want to calm everybody down by hauling a couple tech executives in front of Congress every now and again, and, you know, asking them some questions and, and, and that sort of a thing. But, uh, is there, is it, are they so tightly connected now? And there's so much money involved that, uh, that it won't happen or is it just going to be a delay after delay after delay and a little bit of appeasement here and there just to keep us distracted via the same companies with things that they can put out there to keep us from focusing on these these issues that weren't really I mean they're issues for us yes but really it's for the next generation and the generation after that so the decisions that we make today uh, and the policies we put in place today yeah fine for us but it's for our kids and our grandkids and their kids it's for the future of this country really um and you're on the front front lines of that but is is the is the connection now so tight and are they so powerful big government and big tech that uh that if we get anything it's just going to be a little bit of appeasement honestly so i'm not a cynic um and i know I'm sorry gonna- sorry i try to remain hopeful publicly <laughs> no, but <laughs> no 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 i and i'm going to be pretty controversial here for a a buttoned up conservative uh in dc but i i think that that Washington has lost the plot. Um, I think the hope is in, you know, the new younger generation of representatives that understand the threat, that are, you know, intimately familiar with how these companies work. Um, and they're willing to, you know, people like Blake Masters, uh, J.D. Vance is really smart. We don't endorse candidates at the Heritage Foundation, but on this topic, these guys are great. Mm. Um, and they understand the dangers because right now, sort of establishment DC, there's... <laughs> Again, not a cynic, but there's so much money to be had from these tech companies. If you've seen some of the figures, they're doling out tens of millions of dollars for lobbying efforts. And this is manifest right now on the Hill. You know, they're about to the Hill is is about to head into August recess and they haven't brought a lot of these antitrust bills, these anti-competitive bills to the floor because, you know, Schumer's got a a daughter, two daughters who work in tech. They're just pumping money money and money and money into these into these campaigns, you know, into their progeny, uh, into these industry groups that profess to sort of stick up for, um, you know, the the regular taxpayer and the consumer, but are also taking money from TikTok. So they're effectively Chinese Communist Party shills. Uh, I, again, not a cynic, but this summer in particular, oh, it's been it has been crazy to see how how, you know, Really, um, I think they see a lot of these um, bills potentially and these actions as existential threats, which to me is okay, that's a good thing, right? Like if they're actually scared of what somebody in Washington will do, number one, that's new. Uh, And number two, that's probably a good thing because it's going to shape the behavior of these tech companies. Because as you said before, and I think this is the end, this is what it matters in the beginning, in at the end of it all is that it's about self-governance. It's about our ability to maintain a self-governing republic because right now these companies are have consolidated power that we should be skeptical of concentrations of power. It's a conservative tradition. Uh, you know, I'm a conservative, so I'm naturally skeptical of this. And all of what they're able to do to us and the content moderation uh, practices, et cetera, 
are downstream, as others have said, from this concentration of power. Mm -hmm. And any sort of threat to that has got them quaking in their boots. And it's the uh, it's effectively delaying a lot of these anti-competitive measures that really good people of goodwill, I think, who understand the threat fully and can diagnose the problem want on the floor. So I think I think we've got an uphill battle to fight. I think there are a lot of forces against us, but I think there's sort of a next generation that understands the issue yeah. and is going to continue the fight. Well, I'm glad you're hopeful. Uh, and uh, yeah, it seems like that with well, Section 230 in particular or the the uh, the entire Communications Decency Act um, has really become an anti-American totalitarian tool, uh, which was not its original intent. And I always like to look back at intent um, rather than what people are wordsmithing today or twisting today or manipulating to get some sort of a, then the outcome they want. What was the original intent of something? Um, so I like to go back to that, but they don't want you to look at the original intent for the most part. Distraction, look over, look over here type of a thing. And uh, you mentioned something earlier and I wanted to ask you uh, about it, but it's about using these counterterrorism tools uh, that we've developed, yeah, let's say, let's say from 9-11 forward um, and labeling people as terrorists or domestic extremists uh, to unlock some of those tools, some of those powers that are held by the federal government. Um, the Department of Justice starting a domestic terrorism unit to look at anti-authority and anti-government ideologies um, and really scare people into not questioning government policies. That seems to be their intent um, by doing these things. But we gave the government a lot of power in the years following 9-11 and now applying these labels. And I always go back to something that an old special forces sniper from Vietnam told me a long time ago. And he said, precision in language reflects precision in thought. And uh, they're using, they're certainly using domestic extremists, uh, terrorists, anti-government ideologies, anti-authority, uh, anti-authority ideologies for a reason. Um, so what, what, uh, what are you doing that's focused on that? Or what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah. Oh, this is, this is huge. And, you know, apart from the, the threat of, you know, having children growing up with these devices attached to their faces and what that does to their spiritual formation and the formation of their consciences, I'd say this is the more uh, near term threat. It's not the ridge line threat as we in the Intel world mm -hmm. say, but this, the is, next ridge line. this is our near term issue. Mm -hmm. So what's happened. And I think this for, for your listeners, you know, uh, when the FBI was instructed by Merrick Garland to start tagging parents who showed up at these uh, school board meetings and protested critical race theory teaching in their public schools, when the FBI started tagging them as potential terrorist threats at the behest of the National School Board Association, which worked with the White House to construct a letter to do so, that's a problem. That's the biggest manifestation. You've got the FBI looking at parents as potential, quote, terrorists. And you and I know that, like, precision in language, that, as you said, unlocks specific power. So it is very, very deliberate that they are using the, this language so that they basically can expand their ability to surveil and target everyday Americans, in this case, parents. Parents. Um, so that's just one data point, but it's, again, it's pervasive. We're seeing this with the creation of the anti-terrorism unit at the DOJ, looking at anti-government or anti-authority ideologies. Mm -hmm. You'll probably remember on February 7th, the DHS issued a bulletin basically saying that spreading COVID misinformation is tantamount to terrorist activity. Uh, so you're all of the things that you and I used to, to look at and to effectively work on has sort of been co-opted uh, and, and used to look at American citizens rather than legitimate external threats. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem. This is a pattern of uh, the disinformation governance boards sort of doing the same thing when we're treating our own fellow citizens as the enemy and not the real enemy, which is the CCP and legitimate terrorists who are actually looking to harm us from the outside. So this to me is, is something I think that, um, you know, as, as you said, if we're going to be citizens and not subjects, we have to push against this with everything that we can because to just sort of quietly sleepwalk into this this system um, that you know works with private companies and the government together to target Americans, that is going to be our undoing. We're, we're frankly going to lose the republic if we allow this to continue. I know. So like this, uh, for my fourth book, The Devil's Hand, I put myself, each book has a, has a certain theme and, um, and I put myself in the enemy's shoes and it's something I thought about while I was in the SEAL teams and what I continue to think about as a, as a citizen today. But um, as I started that book, I thought, 
hey, what, is, what did the enemy learn by watching us on the field of battle in Afghanistan and Iraq over these last uh, 20 years? And um, I thought, okay, I'm going to put myself in their shoes. What would I have learned just looking? Okay, what would I have applied to future battle plans? And as I'm in those shoes, as I'm thinking that through and working on the outline and starting to write, uh, well, COVID hits. And I'm like, well, I'm in the enemy's shoes here. And by the enemy, I mean uh, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, super empowered individuals, terrorist organizations. Um, and I thought, well, they're certainly learning something from our response to COVID. What is that? And what would they, what lessons would they take and apply to their battle plans out of, out of our response to COVID? And so I incorporated that in. Continue writing, summer of civil unrest hits. Once again, if I'm one of those entities, what am I learning from that and our response to it? And how can I use that? Uh, okay. And, we, and then we enter a very contentious political season and election cycle. Uh, once again, the enemy's learning from that. And my takeaway was that, gosh, if I was the enemy, I might not do much. I might just take a breath and let, we're doing a pretty good job of destroying ourselves from the inside right now. Um, yeah. And uh, almost these entities I just described have an ally in big tech, because what do they do? They divide. Um, and what our politicians do? Well, they do the same thing. Uh, so, but I, then I had to figure out a creative way. I'm like, it's not a very good book. If I just end it like that, that's not very hopeful. Um, I need my protagonist to go save the day here. Uh, so I had to figure out a creative way to have the enemy have to take an action. And so that was, a, you know, it's fun for me as, a, as an author to, to figure out those the creative ways to move the, the plot board. But uh, that, th that was scary, you know, to, to realize that if I was an enemy, we might not even need to do anything. We can just sit here. Maybe we can just poke and prod here at times that are appropriate just to continue, uh, you know, the, this path that America is on, but we can just watch. Um, and you mentioned China earlier and, uh, a couple of times. And, you know, when we talk about threats to U S national security, I mean, obviously what we just talked about, I think, uh, fits, but, uh, when we talk about China and, and we talk about artificial intelligence and quantum computing and passive targeting hypersonic weapons, and then we look at these tech companies in particular, not just tech companies, pharmaceutical companies as well, other ones that have touch points with, uh, with national security, um, working with Chinese company, which means they're essentially working with the Chinese communist party. Um, Apple has a joint venture, I think with, uh, essentially the government of China, um, so when you look at that, uh, what are your thoughts on U.S. tech companies in particular and their relationship with China? Yeah, so there's a, a line of argumentation out there, even in, in my circles, basically saying if you, you know, try to uh, impose anti-competitive, uh, you know, legislative efforts on these tech companies, or if you try to level the the market and the playing field, then that is going to hurt us with our competition with China, because you know we have our own national champions that, like the Googles of the world, that are going to contest their national champions. Mm. I think that's entirely false, especially as you said, the joint venture, uh, Tim Cook signing a, a secret 2016 deal with the CCP to the tune of $275 billion to develop their technological prowess. That's a problem. You're directly working with our adversary at that point. You're not helping in the China challenge. You're hurting in the China challenge. This has happened with Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos worked with the CCP propaganda arm. Uh, we also know that Google has Beijing-based artificial intelligence research labs that are affiliated with the PLA, the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army. So you're, these tech companies are actively working with the CCP against U.S. interests to help with their military development. Even General Dunford, uh, when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a good Marine, 2019, basically said, uh, we, you're indirectly contributing to the military development of China if you're Google. Actually, no, let me correct myself. You are Google is directly contributing to military uh, tech development because in China, I think people need to understand their systems are <laughs> completely different. Their system of government uh, governance in particular, they have national intelligence and cybersecurity laws that basically say any private entity is working for the state, period. So even if you're just working with a, a private Chinese technology company, you are working for the CCP. Even if your cute little dance app and your social media platform is headquartered in Beijing or the parent company is headquartered in Beijing, that is working and directly responsible to the CCP. So 
getting that sort of <laughs> through Americans' heads um, and letting them know that these big tech companies are not on our side. Mm. They are on their own side. They're on the, the global constituency side. I think that's important first and foremost. Um, and then secondly, I think what's going to save us in the end are these smaller competitors, right? Are these new entrants, the people like uh, Shield AI, like Anderl, that Palmer Lucky is working on. These young companies that are up and coming that really do believe in America, that grow up in full recognition of the China challenge, those are the ones that need to be allowed to compete, to thrive, despite big tech companies' best efforts to keep them down mm. uh, in order to actually be the answer to the China challenge. Wow, that gives me a little hope. I'm going to have to look into to some of those because uh, cause I, I wasn't really aware of, of uh, those ones you just mentioned. But I'm glad that there is uh, kind of up-and-comers that are uh, the, the underdogs are out there that might appreciate why they have the opportunity to build something uh, at all. Uh, and that's, you know, because of people who sacrificed everything for, for us to be able to make these choices. Um, but you've said that it's time to go on offensive against big tech. And I love that. Um, and I love that it comes probably comes, I mean, just from you as a person, but also from that background, working at JSOC and the DIA and going down range. So I love how you, you frame it. Um, but what is the full spectrum approach, uh, to going on the offensive when we talk about antitrust policies, uh, holding tech executives accountable. And, uh, I think you talked about the GoFundMe example of fraud and breach of contract and taking money for one thing. And then wanting to apply it elsewhere. Uh, it's a crazy that they even thought that that was uh, one, just morally and ethically okay. Uh, but then it was even legal to do that. Essentially, you stole people's, I mean, it's so obvious to someone without any sort of a legal background, you just apply a little common sense to that situation. Um, ugh, crazy. Uh, but algorithmic transparency and then transparency around data and how much they're collecting, where it's going, how long it's stored. Um, so what, what is going on in the full, what's that full spectrum approach to you? Yeah. So as you well know, I mean, you want to attack the enemy on all fronts, right? Um, and we do believe that big tech is the enemy of the people. I think that's been borne out in the past two years, especially with how they're targeting our children. Mm -hmm. It's time to say absolutely not, no more. So um, a political figure actually said that Heritage has recognized that big tech is the Death Star. So we have to shoot everything at it at all times. And, you know, I say that's pretty accurate and you captured it well. Focus reform of Section 230, not a silver bullet, but a good start. These antitrust reforms, I mean, there's some uh, measures that have already sort of passed out of committees unanimously that basically say, hey, if uh, the Texas attorney general wants to bring a suit against Facebook, they shouldn't have to do it in a favorable district to the tech companies like uh, New York or Northern mm. California. They should be able to have a venue like Texas that is more responsive to the representatives of the people, which he, uh, the Texas attorney general, is actually representing. So, so antitrust reform, that's a good example of if we need to modernize antitrust law, same thing. It, when Mike Lee, uh, Senator Lee, introduced his ad tech bill, he was looking specifically at how these companies exploit um, users effectively by combining the buy side with the sell side. So they've they've captured this market, the exchange portion of the market and, and the other portions of the market as well. So they don't let competitors in. Mike Lee, okay, let's target that. That's great. I think, you know, again, we can't stump for legislation, but these are good ideas. Um, another idea would be to actually uh, make sure that the government can't use these tech companies as agents to chill speech. So when Jen Psaki and the Surgeon General are going in there and talking with Facebook saying, mm, we have 12 accounts that we don't like, and then a month later, they're purged from Facebook. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. We should make a law from scratch against that. They cannot be used in the service of administrations that basically want to police the speech of Americans. Um, holding these executives liable, like you said, for, for breach of contract, um, uh, legitimate fraud. I mean, that's huge. If something gets to Tim Cook's ears or Mark Zuckerberg's ears and gives them pause, that's a win because that hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, we would stiff arm anyone from DC when I was in California. We knew that they weren't important. They couldn't get it together to actually have an effect on us. All right, well, let's hold the executives accountable and see if that actually makes them a little, 
a little more worried. Uh, data privacy is critical, requiring transparency. You know, how these content moderation practices are enacted, what is the impact of these algorithms on users? Uh, let Give us a, a publicly available report. Let's actually see. Because when we were writing our transparency reports in Silicon Valley, we you guys saw what we wanted you to see. Mm. No, there actually needs to be some teeth behind prompting these companies to change their behavior or else, again, nothing's going to change. Our kids are going to spiral into these um, algorithmically induced um, uh, morasses mm. that they're currently mired in today and nothing's going to get better. It's only going to get worse. So so those are part of the ways that we would effectively, hopefully effectively uh, fight these big tech companies. And frankly, uh, I think we should prohibit joint ventures with the CCP period as well. Yeah. And when you think about like, uh, some of these things that go up in front of Congress and maybe there's some fines attached to uh, letting your data go here or there and to these companies that have accumulated more wealth than any company or entity in the history of, of civilization, essentially, uh, mod Drop modern history, let's say. Um, that, well, okay, you know, if you're worth $100 billion um, as an individual and you get fined like $20 million or something, all right, like th that there's no, that, that's not a penalty. You know, you've already made it back in the amount of time yes. it took you to transfer it and pay it. You've already made it back. Who knows how, you know? Uh, so those things, like you said, it has to have some teeth. Um, it has to have some teeth. And then when we talk about politics, gosh, it's so tough today because, you know, um, you know, growing up, you'd see a politician and there was a level of respect there. And, you know, they, you know, going into politics, there was a lot of veterans, like early seventies, I think was the time when we had the most veterans in Congress because we had these World War II generation that were, you know, getting up there, but now it was time for them to, 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 or sell their company or move on from their company and run for office or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's dwindled uh, over time for very many veterans in there. But it seems like, gosh, I can't even imagine running for office and just because you're stepping out there and just letting everyone on planet Earth shoot an arrow at you. Um, yep. where back in the day, okay, you had to actually physically go up to a podium in order to get, you know, get, get an arrow shot at you literally or figuratively, um, more, more, mostly figuratively, uh, or you had to sit down with uh, a journalist that was going to ask you some tough questions. Uh, and then as a citizen, you were going to read about, read that interview, or you're going to watch it on TV. But now, 24 seven, very similar to high school kids that used to be able to get away from bullies at school at, at three o'clock and go home and not have to deal with it again until like eight o'clock the next morning. Um, there was break. Now there's no break. Same thing for politicians. I think you're just out there getting shot at figuratively, um, all day, every day. It sounds, it looks horrible. Uh, but then you see it as a draw for certain people as a way to accumulate some wealth. Okay. Well, that's a little different. Um, now you can go in and get a salary of whatever, let's say $150,000, whatever it is. And then after 10 years, all of a sudden you're worth 15 million. How did that happen? I guess you're just an astute investor uh, wanting mm. to serve your country as a, in the political realm. Uh, somehow there's a correlation between being a very astute investor, I guess. it's. <laughs> but I don't know. But I wonder if, if uh, politics and you know government is drawing the wrong sort of person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the really interesting, uh, not to... to amplify big tech or anything like that. But there are still some good guys on Twitter that I think, you know, as others have said, we need to fight for our rights to stay on these platforms too. Um, and one good Twitter account is Unusual Whales. Ooh, um, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, it's it's really good. He sort of tracks uh, uh, people's stock purchases and whatnot. Oh, uh, interesting. So, yeah, we got Nancy Pelosi at the top of the heap. I uh, saw that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so there are some good things to uh, the democratization of information as originally conceived. Uh, some guys, some good guys, slip through, but. Yeah. In terms of, you know, the, the politicians, I think that's actually the biggest problem when it comes to confronting the big tech issue is. A lot of these politicians and even conservatives are sort of bamboozled by a, a sort of a free market fundamentalism, or at least this ossified dogma that basically says, you know, the market will adjudicate the market no matter what. But we've seen that's not always the case. Uh, if you look at immigration, Victor Davis Hanson points this out. The market doesn't always adjudicate and help us in our conservative values. And as our heritage president is fond of saying, and he's totally right here, is the human beings don't exist to serve the market. The market exists to serve human flourishing. And in particular, 
families and, you know, us being good citizens and being able to sort of propagate those values uh, within our children, et cetera. I'm thinking about this a lot. I'm nine months pregnant right now. Oh my so goodness. That's a, you know, Congratulations. One of the biggest things, yep. and, uh, and I think that if we just say these big tech companies, because they make the pointy GDP line go up are an absolute good, that's totally wrong. And we need to understand what they're actually doing to the country. Yeah. Uh, and again, if they, especially if they work with the government to infringe upon the God-given rights of Americans, then we have to take a step back. And especially if you're a politician and say, is this serving the values that we want to propagate in the future in our country, which is a legitimate sovereign country with a sovereign citizenry? If they can't answer uh, yes to that, then I think it's time to take these guys to task. But, you know, I don't I don't envy uh, politicians because you have that, you know, oh, private company, good, private company, good. But when private companies start to infringe upon the rights of Americans, yeah. this is a first principles thing. And it's an issue. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's only a matter of time till uh, what was it? Unsung, what was it? Unsung whale? What? The Twitter account? Unusual, unusual whale. Unusual whale. Here you read my writing. It's <laughs> yeah. like, uh, unusual whales till they just shut him down. I mean, boom. Oh, you know, oh, you said something sure. that uh <laughs> that going back to 230 right here, you you posted something that is otherwise objectionable. You're gone, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> unusual whale. Sorry. Um <laughs> oh, wild. And then uh when you talk about big tech's totalitarianism. I mean, that's right there in the title of this, uh, of your report here. Um, and people can find it on heritage.org. Definitely go check it out. Check it, your, your bio out on there is amazing. Even though I read it, read it again on there and then look at all the, the things that all the, the articles that, uh, that you've, uh, contributed. Um, this is amazing, but the totalitarianism piece, when we talk about sprinting towards a totalitarian state with big government and big business, um, I think that kind of sums up a lot of what your is in, is in this report right here. Um, but what, uh, what made you focus on totalitarian state or totalitarianism? Yeah, so that was a deliberate nod to the hand in glove practices that big tech companies and big government effectively are 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 practicing at this point. Um, the political, you know, Hannah Arendt, a uh, philosopher, basically said, uh, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here. Forgive me for butchering this, but she basically said totalitarianism is shaping society uh, and making everything political, right? So you're you're shaping society in one political direction. I think we're seeing that come out of these big tech companies, again, working with the government when it comes to all facets of our life. So I focused in that report on, you know, the digital surveillance issue, uh, a China-style social credit system that I see coming down the pipe on our shores that COVID sort of ushered in and accelerated, um, and, uh, and, you know, just various instances of content manipulation and information control. But we're also seeing this manifest in things like uh, sexual identity, um, tearing down the family, um, you know, gender dissatisfaction and how it sort of fans social contagions, um, like with young girls in particular. So when you have a, a four-star admiral um, standing in front of a camera saying it's okay to start empowering children to change their gender and whatnot, and big tech is leaving it up and they're taking down anyone who says, actually, this uh female four-star admiral is, is a man and they're sort of purging those people from the platform or suspending them, then you have that movement toward a society where everything is political and the government and the private sector are working together to ensure that that's sort of the law of the land, so to speak. So it's, it was a very deliberate uh, word choice. <laughs> Not all my friends uh, uh, appreciated it when they were editing it uh, within the building and whatnot, but Ultimately, I think it's very, very critical for Americans to understand that this administration in particular is working with private entities to infringe upon their rights and effectively change the landscape of the country as we grew up and, and knew it uh, and um, completely fundamentally transform it, as oh, has yeah. been uh, um, discussed before. Oh, yeah. I want to encourage everybody to go and read this thing. Look, at, I, my highlighting is like everything, so that doesn't really help. Um, <laughs> but when I when I read something that uh, that is so impactful, um, that's often how my highlighting looks. Um, but I'm going to read one, one thing here. And you say that the growing symbiosis between big tech and government gives these companies undue influence over Americans' daily lives and undermines their rights. Big tech has increasingly exercised pervasive control of information and access to the digital space in ways that undermine freedom of a functioning republic. 
It's time for aggressive reforms to ensure that big tech is held accountable, provide scrutiny and oversight, and constrain its ability to reshape society. Fundamentally transform, which is uh, what they're in the process of, of doing right now. And uh, yep. I mean... We love a we love an underdog story in the United States, you know, and it seems like that's where uh, where we are when we're up against big tech, big government, um, just because they do have so much power. It's it's a tough one, especially for these for kids growing up today. And I want to ask you about that uh, in this article right here um, before I let you go. But before we do that, I do want to ask you about uh, the conservative oversight project and what what that is. Yeah, so this is awesome. This is um, spearheaded by some of my colleagues, uh, m- very uh, venerable and august lawyers and whatnot um, with time in you know, the Trump administration and figuring out uh, FOIAs and how to do them or how to um, uh, process them and write them very effectively. So the whole idea is as you know, the left has been so aggressive. They've they've been you know changing again the way that our our children see the world and public schools, et cetera. They've been taking over every institution. The long march through the institutions, right? Mm-hmm. They took that very seriously. Uh, they have the academy. They have Hollywood. They have business. They have the Chamber of Commerce now. You know, they've they've yeah. basically insinuated themselves in their worldview into everything um especially the government you know we people who thought they were electing a sweet old grandpa and joe biden have uh come to find a, a very different mm-hmm. um man in the oval office and uh the left is is basically pervasive so we need a counter conservatives need to learn how to fight and this is something that you know the governor of florida has shown us that we can actually wield power uh, to protect conservative values, which, you know, we, we're the reticent ones. We, we believed in the institutions. We just want to sort of have our families and take care of them. And if we want to homeschool, we'll do that too. But we didn't really want politics to be in every conversation, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, you might not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Mm. And I think parents have found this out in the past two years in particular. And so we at the Heritage Foundation, we're going on offense again. And we think when it comes to the border and what's happening, we have open borders now. You know, I'm from a Mexican-American family who took long, long, many years to to come here legally. And this is shall not be born. Um, And it is it's just it's too much. It's too fast. Uh, Joe Biden is, is Frank and Mayorkas is derelict in in their duties. So we need to to look at that. We need to hold them accountable. Uh, and the conservative oversight project is basically just saying we've got our eye on you. We're going to get all the information through as many FOIA requests as we can, including the Babel Street one that I talked mm-hmm. about outsourcing digital surveillance on American citizens. Um, and we're when we hopefully get into power again. We are going to, as Victor Davis Hanson said, use the Old Testament rule. And we, you guys are going to come up before Congress. You guys are going to answer for what you've been doing to America, to wreck America Mm -hmm. uh, for the past at least a year. And um, heritage is going to hold you to account. I think that's that's the aggression that conservatives need or or else we're going to lose a republic. Yeah. I mean, if there's not much I would do differently if I was trying to destroy this country from within when we talk about, uh, well, open borders. We talk about losing our energy independence um, when relying on our enemy for our energy that runs our national security <laughs> establishment. Uh, okay. And outs- now we- and outsourcing pharmaceuticals that uh, also uh, a, a national security issue to where to China, at least some per- precursor drugs or whatever else that they're, they're doing over there. And our, the chips that run our planes and our ships and everything else. I mean, those things right there, those three, uh, I mean, and, and those are fixable. I think those are, those are, are fixable, but we have elements within our society and people who have been manipulated to think that it's a good idea to, uh, to have our pharmaceuticals made in China, to have our chips made in China, to be reliant on, uh, on, uh, our enemies for our energy, uh, countries that want to see us destroyed. Oh, but we have to ask them now for, for oil and they, uh, anyway, so there are a couple of things that we could do. You know, that, <laughs> once again, common sense. Karl von Clausewitz said one of the most important elements of a battlefield leader is having common sense. Uh, George Marshall said the same thing. Um, and speaking of common sense, and because there is a tie-in here, I think, to, to Afghanistan. When you watched last August, you know, almost a year ago now, and watched our, our withdrawal, you know, people that had no background in the military, never read a book on tactics or strategy or foreign policy, um, never watched a documentary on anything military, 
they could look at that situation, apply some common sense, and ask some questions. Yet now it's since it's disappeared. Twenty years we spent there essentially, and now we don't even talk about it. Which means that yeah. are we going to take those lessons of those last twenty years and apply them going forward as wisdom, or we're just not going to talk about it anymore? Once again. Legacy media, which is essentially a propaganda arm of the Democratic Party, big tech. Yep. We're just going to move on. We're going to distract you with something else. But 20 years of blood and treasure, and that's how it ended up. And now we're just going to distract you with something else over here and hold no one accountable. Everyone's failed upward. So uh, when we talk about big tech or legacy media, um, and we talk about that, that situation uh, in particular, what were your thoughts when you were watching that happened, having served there, um, and uh, and then having this touch point with big tech and what you're doing now. What were your thoughts on the withdrawal? Yeah, it was devastating. And I mean, has one head rolled, as you've talked about? You know, the, the one head that rolled was the lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps who spoke out against it. Um, and that was about it. But you don't hear from him anymore. And his story was only amplified on conservative outlets. Um, you didn't hear much about him in, you know, prestige or elite media at all. And I, I just think that, you know, we as the United States were, uh, what did Benjamin Franklin say, or, you know, at least one of the, the founding fathers was, was basically like, you got to have a free press, guys. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's in there as well. Um, and we, at, at this point, you know, we, we may have a, a free press, but is it an independent press? Um, Ron DeSantis said, you know, Democrat or you know, legacy media is big tech. They're, they're mouthpieces for the Democratic Party, as, as you said as well. And I think when Americans don't get the full story, um, it, it hurts us because we vote for these leaders and we want them to make decisions that represent our will, you know, we the people. But if we don't know what's actually going on, then that is hugely problematic. And when big tech, which professed to be this democratizer of information, as I talked about before, but uh, was derelict, is derelict in its duty, then American citizens are only being fed, you know, one line of thought. So. To me, that was absolutely devastating. The fact that it's been buried um, when when everybody knew what a disaster it was. Uh, did the State Department even talk to the Pentagon? Uh, you shut down Bagram, uh, and then you you draw everyone in to to, to Kabul. I mean, it, to me, who you know, I'm not a tactician whatsoever, but it was very very obvious uh, what was going on, what would happen. The 13 service members who gave their life to me that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I went on Fox a few days before and I said, this is there's going to be a terrorist incident here. And sure enough, and it, it because it was obvious to me and I hadn't set foot on Afghan soil for almost a decade at that point. Uh, so I think the the rank incompetence and, and not just that, but the fact that General Milley is going in front of Congress and he's talking about white rage and the Navy is saying you have to read Ibram X. Kendi books on critical race theory and we're not actually focusing on vanquishing the enemy as our nation's fighting force. What is going on here? No wonder you can't meet your recruitment goals and you're having to slash all sorts of expectations. Um, so, so that worries me. And I think Afghanistan was sort of just the beginning of all of the problems under the surface for our nation's military and going forward, it, it, it really, really worries me that, you know, people are not going to sign up like, like my dad signed up, like my husband signed up, like you signed up at all. So it's, um, it is something I'm very, very worried about. And we can't let them capture this institution as well. I know. And it's, uh, yeah, that, that may, may have been one of the last ones, but it's, yeah, it, it's tough to watch and it's heartbreaking and, and watching that withdrawal from Afghanistan. I know you read this book and I wish more yeah. Americans would read it. Uh, you know, yep. H.R. McMaster, Dereliction of Duty. This is a what, 1998 or seven. Or, I think it was a major when he wrote this, but it's fascinating look at, uh, at Vietnam and uh, the president's uh, relationship with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and, and how that, uh, it, that just really uh, doomed us. Um, and I wish more politicians would read this, more people in the military would read this. Uh, where did you discover this and when did you, when did you read it? Um, it was on my dad's bookshelf. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So like, like any good Marine Corps officer, he, uh, he had all the good ones. Yeah. So I would just take, uh, whatever I thought was interesting and pour over it. Yeah. And, uh, hence the, the King's College of London nice. sort of interest and mm -hmm. in, in going there. Cause that's all I wanted to read. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, gosh, well, 
I don't want to, I've kept you too long already, but I want to ask you about this latest, uh, your latest piece here also, June 1st, once again, heritage.org, check it out. Um, and uh, some key takeaways here. And I love how they're, how these are, are um, organized here because you get these key, key takeaways uh, in front here. You get a little summary and then you deep dive. But um, right here, these companies poison American youth with their content that, that warps their perceptions of reality and even impairs the development of their consciences. And then there's this Kids Online Safety Act, which I, which I hadn't heard of until, until I read this. Um, and uh, right, the big tech is a moral crisis first. And I put a little asterisk by this one. Uh, big tech is the enemy of the people, not merely because they have taken advantage of our free market principles. They have earned this untoward distinction because of what big tech does to us in our relationships with one another as human persons. That, that's, that's the be all and end all. That's the critical element of all of this. You know, um, we, we want and we're looking for human flourishing. And those of us in the policy world, we can get lost in the minutia and again in that you know free market fundamentalism and all of the bromides and the tropes and whatnot that have uh, frankly been the dogma of our party but we have to understand what it does to human relationships and that's first and foremost as my mom used to say you know it's all about the people life is all about the people and what these devices do to us and what they're doing to our children you know it's deliberate and I'm I make no bones about that uh, these companies employ psychology to make them more addictive. It's all about engagement. Um, someone used to say that uh, at my old company, the reason why we have a blue um, motif is because blue is easier on the eyes. It makes you want to look at it more. It makes you want to pick up and you know pl click on that app more instead of a big red one. Oh, interesting. So yeah, these are deliberately designed to, to draw you in. TikTok's algorithm, same kind of thing. Um, and they employ psychologists to, to figure out how to maximize engagement. When it comes to young kids, same exact thing. Um, Facebook has said that tweens, not just teenagers, but tweens are a valuable but untapped market. They're trying to compete with TikTok for the younger generation. So they, they're hiring, Twitter even, is hiring people who know how to appeal to really young kids and to draw that expertise out and make them uh, even more effective with another generation because that's sort of a, a consumer for life. Uh, one of the uh, representatives basically said, Handing kids a social media device is like handing them a lit cigarette and hoping that they get addicted for life. It's the same exact kind of thing. It's not a moral panic either, because we know that if you've gone out to dinner, this is what Blake Masters has said, and I've um, seen it in my own life. If you go out to dinner, kids are, every kid has their own device and they're all scrolling. Nobody's relating to each other. These connections are ersatz. They're not real. And yet we're falling deeper and deeper into these rabbit holes and we don't understand how to relate to each other anymore. Uh, so it's a moral issue. Um, Abigail Schreier writes about this and dissatisfaction with their genders, young women. They have a bevy of cheerleaders on social media, Tumblr, YouTube, all of these things sort of sink them into um into themselves, right? We're all navel gazing here, essentially. We're all selfie narcissists now. Uh, no one wants to look each other in the eye. So uh, frankly, we need to be able to discuss this as a moral conundrum and a moral issue. So hopefully articulating that will, will get people more comfortable with the squishiness of, of that argument. Yep. No, exactly. Right here, I uh, say big tech companies are aware of the effect they have on young people and yet continue to forge ahead and even expand their efforts. I mean, you know, people on the, at these companies have kids. Um, uh, it's just, it's a, it's so, it's so difficult. Uh, but same thing, like you wouldn't, that, that person that hands your six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old a cigarette or uh, the, the shady drug dealer, whatever, like if we go back to like the seventies or eighties or something like that, like hanging out near the school, that sort of a thing, trying to get, uh, get some new customers. Um, uh, well, that's what's happening here. And it's, I think on a, on a much larger scale. Uh, it's affecting much, many more kids, um, and, and in a way that's going to, uh, impact them for the rest of their lives. So, you know, as 
it's, it's tough. You know, what would you do to that person that handed your seven-year-old a cigarette? Unfortunately, you know, I can, in my books, it's very therapeutic to take some of these people out or apply some of these, uh, <laughs> you know, so, some of these ideologies to people who are bad guys in the books. And then my protagonist gets to take them out in various ways. So for me, that's very therapeutic and it keeps me out of prison. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, uh, it, it's, it's tough as citizens and, and parents in particular, once again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, holding these tech companies accountable. Yeah. And the fact is we didn't discover until last fall when the Facebook whistleblower released all of those documents, we didn't know what the tech companies knew about their effect on kids. Right. So um, she released internal studies that Facebook had conducted that basically said, um, you know, one in three young girls, teenage girls, if they had body image issues to begin with, Instagram made them feel worse. Uh, 6% of teenagers in America trace their suicidal thoughts directly to going on Instagram. So they've known this for a very long time. They, they conducted these studies themselves, and yet they continued building that platform for children, the Instagram platform for children under 13, only again, pausing when it came to light. So the, the fact that I think the key issue here is they know what it does to kids. They know how much it harms them and they're full steam ahead. They, they're sort of like, well, oh, you know, that, that can wait, we can, we can make this actually work for humanity. But Sundar Pichai famously said, my 11-year-old in 2018, he absolutely does not get a device. Uh, Steve Jobs, before he died, my child will not be on, will not have an iPad. Are you crazy? And these people in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto and all of these places, they don't give their kids these devices at all. And it's, it's sort of a rules for thee, but not for me mm -hmm. kind of situation where they're completely insulated from their creations and the devastating effects that they have on their creations. But, you know, our children are just fine getting sucked into those domains. I know. I know. Ugh. Uh, well, what's ahead for you? I know you have a little one on the way. Are you thinking about maybe writing a book at some point? Because I think that would be amazing considering your, your background, which is one book in and of itself. Uh, and then about some of these, uh, these issues that we, that we talked about today. What's on, the, what's on the horizon and the next ridge line for you? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm thinking of my little girl and that's kind of got blinders on. Um, and, um, frankly, just continuing at heritage to, to try to make this world as good as the one that we grew up in, you know, cause I don't, I don't think our, our country is the same. Um, so trying to evangelize in that regard, trying to talk about how, you know, we can't just say because tech companies are private companies, they should be immune to any sort of accountability whatsoever. And, and frankly, uh, preach some solutions and, and make those, uh, the, continue to make those runs on the hill and, and convince people that uh, big tech is an enemy of the people and it needs to be held to account. So Maybe a book in the future. I don't know. So. Maybe uh, maybe I'll <laughs> move to a cabin in Montana yes. at some point after I hang it all yeah. up. But, uh, but yeah, just just focusing on the baby for now. Got it. Got it. And uh, interesting, you mentioned uh, we just talked about Apple, but I posted I guess two years ago uh, and then this last year as well. I posted that 1984 Apple commercial, um, you know, where it, it, a woman comes in and she switch dressed like a Hooters waitress for some reason and comes in and swings <laughs> the sledgehammer and throws it into the screen. And boom, this year, 1984 will not be like 1984. And it aired once, I think right during or after the Super Bowl in, uh, in 84, uh, you can find it online on, on YouTube. Um, uh, but I posted that and I said something like ironic, you know, or something, something like that. I have a little, maybe one liner or something. Um, and, uh, and it made it through two, two years ago this year, censored, took it down. Mm -hmm. They did not like that. Yep. But, when you when you've got their mark, uh, they uh, they watch you like a hawk. It's crazy. Yeah, it's noticeable. Yeah. But hey, that's uh, it's you know, it, it's the battle space. You got to adapt and uh, got to figure it out. Got to um, aggressively solve problems, creatively solve problems, capitalize on momentum, do all these things that we do on the battlefield. But this is a this is another one, and I'm so glad uh, that you're on that battlefield, on the front lines of it, because it's, it's so important for the future of the country. And you articulate these issues and the solutions uh, in a way that very few can. So uh, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking this on uh, and all your work at Heritage and everything else you've done for the for the country. Um, and uh, yeah, it couldn't be of uh, more vital uh, importance to, to the future of the nation. So, so thank you so much. Oh, right back at you, Jack. Thanks for everything you do. Oh, appreciate it. Take care. 
Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. I have been a member since 1996. There's my original card right there. I uh, got that at Damneck, Neck, Virginia, when I was at Intelligence Specialist A School at the Navy and Marine Corps Intelligence Training Center uh, on Damneck, Neck, Virginia, right before I went to BUDS. So it was boot camp, ISA school, BUDS, and then off to the races in the SEAL team. But the entire time, to include through today, I have been a member of Navy Federal Credit Union. And now they're sponsoring this podcast, which is amazing. Crazy how things come full circle like that. Becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union lets you experience more from everyday commutes to your next big vacation. The flagship credit card earns you three times the points on travel so you can get rewarded for wherever you're headed next. Plus this premium travel card has a low annual fee of $49 and two times the points on all purchases outside of travel which means the rewards don't have to end even when the vacation does. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone. And it's so fast, you can get a, de a decision in seconds. Navy Federal Credit Union has great rates on auto loans. With their car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare, and get upfront pricing on your next new or used car. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Nice. I like that. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD veterans, and their families. Flagship rates are variable and range between 10.74% and 18% APR based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. That's NavyFederal.org. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one in the Amazon series adaptation of the terminal list. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's coffee. Keep crushing. Thank you so much to Six Hour for jumping right on board out of the gate to make this podcast possible. Obviously, I am a huge SIG fan, having carried the P226 on every deployment downrange in the SEAL teams. Uh, but SIG was a supporter. They were friends well before uh, I was a New York Times bestselling author, uh, well before I even had an Instagram account or any social media presence whatsoever. So thank you guys all so much. Uh, Ron, Tom, Jason, everybody at SIG who gets up every day and continues to crush it and lead the way. SIG is always adapting. They're always at the forefront, whether it is firearms for citizens, whether it's firearms for our military, ammo, suppressors, optics, training, fire control units. They are doing it all and they are always pushing pushing that envelope and trying to do it better each and every day through innovation and adaptation they crush. So thank you so much for that friendship and support. Uh, it will never be forgotten. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right. I just opened this typewriter, new typewriter from 1930. And this is from Megan at the Unplug Typewriter Company. Uh, you can follow her and Unplug Typewriter Company at Unplug Typewriter Co. Co. Uh, on the social channels. And this right here uh, has been wrapped up for months now because when Megan says it sends a typewriter, it is wrapped in bubble wrap. She makes sure that nothing is going to happen to this in transit. So that means it takes a while to unbox this thing. So I didn't unbox it on camera because uh, it took a long time, but I used Winkler Blade right here as a folder that they don't make anymore. So uh, Daniel and Karen, thank you for this. Uh, but 
it, uh, it did take some work to get this open. And thank you, Megan, for the kind note that she wrote on this typewriter right here. Uh, so that was so kind. Thank you so much. And she always includes a manual and uh, from that time frame, this is a copy of one right here. And I uh, just love the care and effort that goes in to restoring these machines. So you can see I have a couple of special typewriters behind me. Uh, this will go behind me for now and then into the new podcast studio that is almost finished. So uh, look at this original paint from 1930 right here. So Megan, incredible work. Uh, just amazing. And good job. The, uh, the handle was destroyed. So you made a paracord one for me. Well done. Well done. I love it. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait to get this in its new, in its new home. So thank you so much. It means a, it means a ton to me. Uh, we just talked about Winkler knives right here with this folder and this one right here, this is a special one. So I was just out in North Carolina with Daniel Winkler and with Kevin Holland. And this knife right here, this is the Winkler Knives Operator. And this is a collaboration between Daniel Winkler and Kevin Holland. And if you don't know who Kevin Holland is, uh, you can look him up. Not too much out there about him, but uh, there may be more soon. We shall see. But he came on the podcast. We recorded one, me, Daniel, and Kevin, while I was out there in North Carolina, where... Uh, Kevin was forging a blade and I was forging a tomahawk and, uh, just an incredible guy. Uh, somebody I respect, uh, uh, just more than I could possibly, uh, really express right now, but this right here, this knife. So this is a special one because the handle comes from an AK, the wood from an AK, uh, somebody in Afghanistan didn't need it anymore. And, uh, so yeah, this one right here, Kevin, thank you, my friend. Amazing. Uh, you can find this version once again, winklerknives.com. Go check it out. This is the Winkler Knives operator and you can find out more about it on, uh, on the website. Very cool. What else here? Well, one more thing, Simon and Schuster, Atria, Emily Bessler books. Thank you for sending this right here. This is pretty cool. I don't know if you can see it, but right here has the cover of in the blood. And then from the New York times has a number one highlighted for print, hardcover, combined print and ebook and audio monthly. So the trifecta, number one across the board for In the Blood. And that is all due to you, the reader, uh, to you, the listener, uh, for taking a risk on me as a, as a new author, and then telling a friend about James Reese and the series. So, uh, so thank you so much. And uh, thank you to to Simon and Schuster, Atria, and Emily Bessler at Emily Bessler Books for uh, for taking a risk on me. So, thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about what Kara Frederick has going on, be sure to go to heritage.org. Her articles are all there to include combating big text totalitarianism, a roadmap from February seventh, and her latest social media is hurting kids, but a fix may be on the horizon from June 1st. You can also follow her on Twitter. Just type in Kara Frederick. Uh, it should pop right up. But if not, it is K-A-R-A-A-F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K. So that is the Twitter handle right there. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA officialjackcar.com. That is the website. You can hit the shop button for the merch from there. And until the next time, take care out there. Be safe, stay strong, keep fighting.